afternoon, everybody. Super excited for, I guess it's really round three with Michael Martin. Um, we are getting together to discuss his most recent book, Sophia in Exile, um, which I, I take it you think of this as the, the third of a trilogy. Well, I, I, I realized it as I was writing that that's what it was. Which was never my intention <laughs> to write a trilogy, but I think so it is. It's the third of the sophiological trilogy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, I guess I have to do it just to do it. I have to ask the question that can't be answered. Before we start, how shall we think about the being of Sophia? I don't know about we. <laughs> I'll tell you how I think of the being of Sophia. Uh, I think the the being of Sophia is uh, the feminine consort of of God, God the Father, and and we can see, and you can see that in a cosmic sense, as like in Proverbs eight, for instance, where Sophia participates in the creation, and and she delights in the children of men. Right, and she's playing all before God. Right, so I think that's those are important um, ideas: the playing and the and the delight, you know. And and this is what I think we see in our experiences of um, whether it's of the arts or of nature or liturgy, when that beautiful thing shines through, that's greater than the sum of its parts. I mean, that to me is Sophie. That's Sophia speaking. You know that, and Sophia, I think, in that way, is a kind of uh, I, I borrow the term metaxu, which means the middle between the divine order and the created order. And I think where the I can call it the proof of that, at least from a Christian perspective, is in the Virgin Mary, who is, as far as I'm concerned, the incarnation of Sophia. And because, as in Proverbs. Uh, Sophia is the conduit through which God, the, the divine essence, creates the world, the physical, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, through the incarnation of Christ, it's Mary who makes the divine palpable, right? Available to the senses in a, in a, in a pure, I mean, a purely real sense mm -hmm. where Christ is palpable to the senses, just like in the Eucharist too, right? It's it's available to the senses. It's a very, and so, and, and as far as I'm concerned, Christianity should be a very sensual religion. And, it, and, it, and in some degrees it is, especially you go to an Orthodox or a Catholic church, especially a more like a traditionalist Catholic church. It's very much a, an experience of the senses, right? Uh, but I, we forget about that. And we abstract away from, from all of that. And I think we, we, we also abstract away from the creation and through, from the arts. And it's interesting to me that in the, the Protestant Reformation, which was a kind of iconoclasm, right? That the arts were held in suspicion. The mass was held in suspicion as theater. That, um, um, and so, the divine becomes kind of sterilized in a, in a compartment, you know, it's compartmentalized away from our senses, which somehow people thought would contaminate the divine. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a lot, of, I read a lot, and I, in this new book, I write a lot about those kinds of things. Yeah, so, um... It's sort of addressed in, in the other book, I would imagine in the first one too, but there's some, there's some reason why she is, as you say, in exile. Although, you know, it seems like it's easier to analyze that from the perspective of uh, the Enlightenment, the post-Enlightenment, but in some sense, she was in exile almost from the very beginning. Exactly. And is that something inherent in her nature? I mean, what is, what is the meaning behind this something that has to be 
revealed as opposed to something that's just uh, given? Uh, that's a great question, great way to put it. Um, I think, um, the way I think about it anyway, is that Sophia in that regard um, um, exemplifies a kind of absolute humility, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, the, the Sophianic does not insert itself upon us, right? Like in, in, a, in a conceptual or dogmatic or, you know, forceful way. It kind of waits in patient, waits patiently for us. Because, and I write in the book, you know, it's not really Sophia who's an exile, we are, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, and, and until, and I, in, in my other book, um, in The Incarnation of the Poetic Word, which is uh, essentially my, <laughs> my philosophy of literary criticism, you know, is, uh, and, and, and I call it uh, agapeic criticism there, there, how can we um, behold that which is present to us? And it's, so I take, a, in that book, I took a kind of phenomenological approach to literary studies. And I think the same thing you see with, with the Sophianic is that um, by our own uh, entrance into a kind of contemplative disposition toward things, you know, and then, and, and this, which is a kind of uh, phenomenological reduction, then what is not only the phenomenon, but what's behind the phenomenon reveals itself to us. Mm -hmm. But you can't, even in that case, you know, this is, I think there's kind of recipro reciprocity with Sophia in this way. You can't do it by force. Right. right, you try to force your way into an understanding; it does not happen. Right. You have to be present to it. That's what I, that's. I think that's the best way for me to describe it. You, you have to learn how to become present to phenomena. Right. Um, so it's almost like her, her very humility has to be met by something humble and. Absolutely. And yes. I think that's it. Yeah, that's beautiful. So. It's kind of, we're going to jump a little bit historically here, but you are, you have been, and you still are a professor of English literature, right? Part time. Yeah. Part time. <laughs> well, they closed, but I was at a school and they closed the school four years ago. Uh huh. 2017, almost five. Uh, and I didn't really want to get another gig. I'm too old to look for it. Get a, get a gig at a college, but I, but but there are a couple uh, liberal arts colleges close by that have have needed people. So I, I you know, I, I still keep my toe in the water a little bit. They're happy to abuse you for adjunct wages. It's it's not too bad, and I don't have to go to meetings, <laughs> you know. And it happens during the winter when I don't have much farm work to do. Good. Well, the reason why I bring it up is there is this relationship between Romanticism and the Sophianic, although it's not always explicit. Yeah. Um, I I looked at your your little your list of books for this next class. It looked like I just yeah. wanted to take the class myself. So when you're teaching a course on Romanticism to undergraduates, I'm sure you're you're concerned that the Sophianic being find its way into your teaching whether yeah. you mention her or not and so assume the audience our audience right now doesn't have that much of a knowledge of romanticism could you just talk about what what are some of the points that you want to make sure you get across to your students um well in that course i can it, it's i love teaching that course because they let me do whatever i want to do <laughs> so i'm doing whatever i want to do so it's actually a course uh, entitled Love and Romanticism. Oh. So actually, not even starting with romantic poets, I start with Vladimir Soloviev in his book, The Meaning of Love. I, don't, mm -hmm. you know, I give him a chapter or two to read from that. And so they can start to think, you know, because, you know, I, I teach literature like a philosopher. So I want them to think about what love is. What is love? You know, because they think they know as all the rest of us do. But if you really, you know, I always tell people, philosophy is just really dumb questions that once you ask them, 
and start thinking about them aren't that dumb after all you know so what is love we start with that and then the after we start with Slovia, i move to yaka burma because of his influence on goethe and novalis and then i have them read hymns to the night mm. and it's only after that that we move to the english romantics and, and what what the romantics were doing goethe and novalis no less than uh, especially Wordsworth, and to a lesser degree, Shelley and Keats, but they were also doing it. Um, Byron, I don't know. He was just nuts. Uh, and Coleridge. They were, they were responding to the kind of deadening uh, cultural trajectory of the Enlightenment and scientism that came along with it. They said, no, 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 no. You're missing half of the world by only paying attention to the physical you know we have moods we have love we have all these other things you know beauty we have experiences of beauty and you, you don't take that into account or you dismiss it as just emo emotive right it's adolescence or something and so that's i mean I, that's why i wanted to teach this course when they asked me what i wanted to teach i said can i want to like, do this because um I think students at around that age and even late high school, you know, they're looking for something real. You know, they get served up a lot of a lot of superficial bullshit and, and our world's full of it. Um, and I think in a way, our moment right now is very similar to that of just before the romantics burst on the scene in, in the early 19th century mm -hmm. or, you know, um, Blake, right? They're they're rejecting the materialism and the, the 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 you could call it spiritual poverty of the Enlightenment and those movements, right? And they're also rejecting to a degree the way that uh, religion was co-opted by it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we see right now. I mean, seeing a lot of the, those those same um, things start to reappear where religion gets co-opted by the technocratic and where you know we're, we're, we're so close to being trapped in a kind of <laughs> technocratic hell realm right now and and I wrote a blog I don't know maybe a year ago about neo-romanticism and thinking that that you know every time through history you look through history you know, there's a there's a real push for scientism and materialism, and there's always a pushback, right? right. You know, another pushback, and I think it was, in a way, the last flowering of our kind of romanticism was in the late 19th and early 20th century with the occult revival and the Irish, uh, what they call the Irish, the Celtic twilight, right? Mm -hmm. They were also responding to, and, in, in a, and I read about it in the chapter on the Green Man in the book, you know, when uh, uh, James Barry wrote Peter Pan and uh, the Cottingley fairies showed up all around the same time as a kind of a cultural phenomenon because they were responding. And look, that came up during World War I. And what was World War I? But the apotheosis of the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment. That's yeah. where it gets you, right? Right. So there's always some, some kind of push against that I mean, you know, unfortunately, the romantics are always uh, understaffed <laughs> compared to the technocrats. But I, I, I see it now. Yeah, I see it now. I see what I see this conspicuous thing that uh, with my clients and the kind of culture they come out of, where for young people, romantic love in particular, eroticism is essentially dead. Yep, it's like a quaint artifact of another time. Mm -hmm. um, which you know, to me, is just almost unbelievable. Yeah, and I talked to my students about that. I said, "When they were going to do this, last time I taught this course, this one girl, you know, I, I said to them because it was mostly women. In fact, it was all women this first time I taught, taught it. And I said, "Do your boyfriends like write poetry for you or anything?" And they're like, "Did <laughs> 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 they don't?" They, you they, ask you, they ask you to play World of Warcraft. 
I know. One girl said, I'll tell you what, my boyfriend writes me a poetry. I married him that day. <laughs> Which, when I grew up, you know, in the sure. 70s and 80s, I, w- I was just, for me, it was assumed if you wanted to win a woman's love, that's the kind of stuff you had to do. Yeah. Right? You had to earn it. You didn't, right. you, know, you didn't buy a hamburger and expect it. Right. If you're a hamburger, you can put out now. Right? Yeah. So I was like, I got to earn your love. Like, it, you know, I felt like, uh, you ever read uh, Brave New World, right? Mm-hmm. John the Savage. Remember when Lenina w- wants to, she's going to unzip her knick and or whatever they call them in the book. And she's like, no, no, don't do this now. I must earn you first. Yeah. <laughs> That's, <Yeah. laughs> we're, we're, we're dinosaurs, dude. <laughs> we're dinosaurs. That's exactly right. But uh, by the same token, um, all the more reason for some sort of romantic revival now. I right? think so. Yeah, I'm and pushing you, that. And you and I are like products, you know, we grew up in the shadow of the 60s, um, which kind of played itself out through most of the 70s. Um, in some sense, I feel like that was even romantic. It I was think much so. more decadent and hedonist, but it was still had that emotive, sensual thing going on. And uh, you notice, and there was an idealism in a lot of the music. I mean, even in Led Zeppelin, where Simba was just about raunchy sex, but others are just idealistic. Yeah. Right? Not about whether it's about love or, you know, the, all the songs about the Hobbit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mythic. Yeah. And they were in Achilles' Last Stand. I mean, because I, and they, were, they weren't the only ones. There was a lot of idealism left in music, which is what attracted me. To playing music when I was a kid, uh, but then I remember I, I went to some event, can't remember what it was, and I came home. It's about 1992 or 93. I came home and I told my wife, "The kids aren't like we were. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's it's cold and it's mm-hmm. you know it's." I don't know what the right word would be. It was just very cold and self-centered in a way. Yeah. Now I'm not saying that we're all kids were like that. And I'm sure there was still some idea that there's always some kind of idealism out in the world. Well, but but, we uh, didn't have we didn't have that irony. You know, we yeah, we, we cynical, have, cynical. It was cynical. We can be cynical, but there was an earnestness still. You know, that, no, I mean there was a cynical cynicism in the world. Right now, in popular music. I think. Oh yes, yes, no doubt. You know. Yeah. So like everything, everything sucks. So I'm going to get what I can get. I often wonder if the whole romantic movement was, um, in some sense, initiatory, meaning that once that ca- the the it was brought forth in the world by all these circumstances, and once it was here large numbers of people almost have to necessarily go through that phase. Like, yeah. like there are many people uh, have to go through a romantic phase. It's interesting you say that because uh, there's a really interesting uh, educational theorist out there. He's Irish, but he teaches in Canada. His name's Kieran Egan. And he's got a book called The Educated Mind. And he says precisely this. He says that he ca- he has different stages of understanding, so it's kind of a think when he thinks of like younger children, he 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 says the younger children have a kind of mythic understanding, right? Right. Whether it's about like um, you know superheroes or stories of the gods or Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy, right? That's kind of mythic understanding, and he says they move from there into a romantic understanding. Oh, wow. And, and he puts it at around the age 13 or 14, I would say 14. And that lasts pretty much through high school, right? Mm-hmm. And I think now it goes a little even later into, into the early years of college. Mm-hmm. And because what he, what he says, he says that this, this is a time where students and children are interested in the mega ergon, the great achievements, right? I don't know if you, you probably remember this. I remember sitting around the table in the library when I was probably seventh grade or something. And we're all looking at the book, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records. 
Oh yeah. What what are the what's the what are the limits of human of ability and achievement? You know, mm -hmm. so you get kind of obsessed with that. And then I was so disappointed when they took the guy with three legs out of there and all those people. <laughs> that was that was a lot of fun, right? Because can you have three legs? I mean, that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. I, mean, I didn't know you could have three legs. And then you start to find out but all these uh, the extremes that the human condition can 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 find itself. And then Egan all says that after students go through a kind of romantic understanding, they naturally, you know, organically come to what he calls philosophic understanding. And it's interesting, you know, he says this and he doesn't talk anything about dentition, right? The changes of teeth. Mm -hmm. But at each one of his stages corresponds to the arrival, you know, the losing of the milk teeth, the 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 wisdom not the wisdom teeth the the 12 year molars that come in right mm -hmm. about 12 or 13 and then the wisdom teeth which come in at about 18 or 19 right mm -hmm. so each one of and, and you know who 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 pointed that out was rudolf steiner mm -hmm. and maria montessori that oh, i didn't know montessori them, pointed out at all i didn't know both that. of them uh, talk significantly about these changes of dentition and the changes of understanding that accompany them. So spinning that back to um, Sophia, could we say that this is um, a cultural manifestation uh, or uh, an asking a question or uh, pushing, I don't know how to put it. That what is a cultural manifestation? Well, the, the Sophianic can reveal itself in many, many ways. And one of the ways it does is in the appetites of people for her. For the real, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't even know what they're, at, what they're hungering for, but they're hungering for something that's real. Yeah, which is kind of interesting that you put it that way because that dovetails so nicely with your discussion of the grail. that it's uh in a sense it's an empty signifier yep yeah because yeah it it's in a way it's the process <laughs> you know mm. it's the process and it's coming it's for i mean the more i think about this and i've been doing been doing this for, thinking about these things for decades trying to figure it out myself right is that i i really i mean I think people want an authentic experience of being human. But I think um, the vocabulary for that has been increasingly unavailable to Western humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I think, and I think you, I, you see all kinds of pathologies out there in the world that are manifestations of that distancing from the real mm -hmm. right yep. that, that being disconnected mm -hmm. people feel disconnected to from their own bodies mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. they feel disconnected from their family whatever they feel disconnected from because they don't know what it is to be connected yeah so they tried to, it's almost like a, a self-initiation in a way right mm -hmm. And you don't, but in, the idea with an initiation in, into a culture or adulthood or something is you have the, a community that guides you into it. Right. Right. If you, whether that's, you know, you know, kind of African uh, societies that have circumcision rituals for boys when they're about 13 or 14, right? Or other kinds of things that that bring you into a different level of consciousness and a different level of uh, participation in the culture and in the society, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have that. No. No. I mean, we're supposed to have graduation. Yeah, now we're all, school's online. School's, I mean, school's insane. Everything's insane. Everything's technocratically run now, whether it's in person or not in person. Right. And even the things that were formerly sacred have been bled of that like marriage mm -hmm. yeah what was a lifelong commitment now can just be 
regarded as a mistake erased with a stroke of the pen. That's right. That's why I wrote that. I keep writing about marriage. Did you notice this? I mean, this is a uh, <laughs> slight way. Surprised. I wrote there and I and in the, the chemical wedding. I have two essays in there, but one really is about marriage. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget presenting. I presented part of that that shit, that essay at the conference at my old school before they closed down. And boy, the looks I got. <laughs> you can imagine, right? Didn't mm -hmm. he say what I think he said? Mm -hmm. Well, it really works really well in the book. And you know, you even make the very good argument that marriage is that it's it's woven into the creation itself. It is. And that's what Sophia, Sophia's yeah. relationship with God, the Father, right? In in Genesis, when God says, let us make man in our image. We're speaking to Sophia. Mm -hmm. Right? Male and female made he them. Right? Uh, and I didn't make that up. I got that from a book it was published, I think, the 20s or 30s by, uh, I think he ended up as an archbishop, but at the time, I think he was a, he was a archimandrite, uh, what was his name? Alexander Musbricky, I think his name is. He was a, a Belgian Benedictine who, be, who left the Catholic Church to become Orthodox. And he wrote this fascinating book, but it's almost impossible to find. It's called From Dyad to Triad. Oh, wow. He wrote... And he wrote in that book, and it's not a very long book. It might be 80 pages long. It's not very long. But he wrote in there what I just said up from Genesis. He said, we need to think about this as this. And was he explicitly Sophianic or Sophiological? Was he making reference to Bulgakov and company? Uh, I don't recall that he mentions them, but he might. I have to look at it again. It's been a while since I read the book. But he was definitely, and he, I think he was in Paris at the time. So he, he knew those guys. Mm -hmm. He's that generation of Bulgakov, mm -hmm. right? And, and which was actually, and if you think about it, that's kind of a romantic movement in Orthodox theology. And of course, there was a, there, the, there was a response against it, right? Hey, how'd you get in here? <laughs> I, didn't, I had no idea my dog was in here. You want to go out? Is that a border collie? Yeah. Uh, yes, the English Shepherd. Oh wow! Yeah. Wonderful. I'm gonna open her. Up. I had no idea you were in here. I had no idea she was here. Well, this kind of brings us to I think what's one of the real power quotes in the book that kind of can weave some of this stuff together. So I'm just gonna read it. It's a it's a quote by Steiner on page 13. Fairly long, so. Audience, I hope the audience can bear with me. We must realize that through the force of the Christ, we must find an inner astronomy that will show us again the cosmos moving and working by the power of the Spirit. When we have this insight into the cosmos, it is awakened through the newfound Isis power of the Christ, which is now the power of the divine Sophia. Then Christ, united with the earth since the mystery of Golgotha, will become active within us because we shall know him. It is not the Christ that we lack, but the knowledge and wisdom of Isis, the Sophia of the Christ. So the sense I get is the last place in creation where the marriage needs to occur is in the souls of human beings. Is that um, yeah, I mean, there was, I think I mentioned it in the book, there's a book by, uh, I can't remember his name, uh, Anglican theologian, the, the, the book is titled, The World is a Wedding. Oh. I think I quoted him. I know I quoted him. And, uh, and still think about it, the Bible begins with a wedding, right? Not just the creation, but with the creation of Adam and Eve. And it ends with a wedding, right? When the new Jerusalem comes down like adorned uh, adorn like a bride for her wedding, mm -hmm. right? 
Mm. I mean, it just permeates and everything in between there. It, it's like the message, right? Is mm. how to bring you back to the wedding. I mean, mm. the first miracle of Jesus is at a wedding. Right. right? Uh, and, he, he, and he calls himself the bridegroom. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. <laughs> Do we need to be more explicit here? Right. But and I and I think that's uh, and I think that's going back to romanticism and the and the romantic itself, right? The, this con conception of, of of eros and love in that way is and, and I this is my big critique in the chapter on marriage of monasticism, which is really work to deprive uh you know, the laity of that understanding of the world, you know, mm -hmm. of marriage itself. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, growing up, going to Catholic school, you know, we always, it, it, the subtext was, well, it'd be better if you were a priest or a nun, but if you can't do that, marriage is okay too. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's, that was the message, you know, and that's yeah. still the message. Right. You know? And the Catholic not, family it's was a false was... message. A good Catholic family would serve someone up to the cloister. That's right. As a standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But getting getting back to Steiner and just applying that to a critique of Christianity, he's saying they have the Christ, but they don't have the Sophia. I mean, that's especially evident in the Protestant Church. Yeah. Which is the one I grew up in, which one it. it there's no sensuality in terms of the ritual or even the decor. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's the abstraction tends towards this place where you wind up in kind of a bibliodolatry where you confuse the being with the book. Yep. Um, but it's not the Christ that they're lacking. It's the Sophia. And so it's really kind of strange to, to lack something that you don't know what you lack. In, in a way, you could say that you, without, I mean, there's an awareness of Christ. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, and, and it's a, it, it ends up being a, a lack of Christ as well, because I don't think you can fully possess Christ without the metaxu connecting the two. Realms, right. right. Yeah. I don't think it's possible. It's an abstraction. I guess that's really kind of what your Berdyayev chapter gets at at the end. Yeah. Which was really quite a stunning way to finish because it's... <laughs> it's it was. It was like, bam! It's apocalyptic, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's saying it's... it's uh, the world is the way that the world is because... Because Christianity failed. Yeah. Yeah, very he, much. Yeah, I mean... But he's one person where I love to talk to him. He and Rudolf Steiner like to <laughs> just get together with them. Well, it was always so shocking that he had an early text that was called The Philosophy of Freedom as well, mm -hmm. which only recently got translated into English. You can get it now. And he actually, he saw, he was friends with uh, Andre Belli, the who uh, was a poet and he wrote this book, Petersburg, which is like the, the Russian uh, Finnegan's Wake. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's, and it's very Sophianic and you know, it's a Russian symbolist. Uh, but Belly was, was a disciple for a little while of Steiner's. And he got Berjaev to come and check him out. So mm -hmm. Berjaev went to a few lectures mm -hmm. and, he, and he speaks about him quite a bit in, in his, one of his books. I mean, he, he respected him, he didn't think he, he wasn't sold, but he, he had respect for him, for sure. Yeah, you can see that anthroposophical influence through that era. There's a book that I have. Um, I don't know if you know this book. It's called Freedom and the Tragic Life by uh, Ivanov. Actually, I think I have it right here. Yeah, I don't know that. Well, it's pretty obscure. Um, yeah. I say something's right here, and of course it isn't. At any rate, um, Ivanov was, you know, one of the Silver Age people, probably a lot of St. Petersburg. And Freedom and the Tragic Life is basically a book about Dostoevsky. Mm. But the analysis is almost entirely through the prism of Ariman and Lucifer. 
Right. Well, yeah. And um, Rajayu adopts that as well. He adopts the language of Araman to describe the, the, the technocratic and uh, the, the, the mechanical of his age. Does he actually use the term Arima? He does. Wow. Well, I guess I haven't seen that. I've read The Russian Idea and uh, his book on Dostoevsky, and I have the Berjayev Reader. I, it's in a, I can't remember which one. It's in a few of them. It's in a few different. Yeah. Ones. yeah. So, are you seeing um, in the anthroposophical world? Are you seeing Sophia getting her due, or is she? What's your impression of that? Um, I try to ignore the anthroposophical world as much <laughs> as possible. Uh, I mean, you hear it. I mean, I've, but I never really heard too much about it. And all my, when I was much closer to it, when I was a Waldorf teacher, very rare. I mean, people have mentioned Sophia, but they didn't seem to penetrate it. It was like, you know, it was thus the doctor has said, right? Yeah. So I did give a lecture on uh, Sophia and, and Rudolf Steiner to the Anthroposophical Society here in Michigan maybe a year and a half ago, I don't know, two years ago, um, which was which was interesting. But they they were they had no idea what I was talking about. Really? They I, I had you know I, which surprised me. I thought speaking to them that they would already have a vocabulary and a, and a background. But I had to back it up and kind of start with baby steps because I don't know how they missed out on this. And, they, they, and I, I mean, I first, the first thing I read about sophiology was in, what's the guy's name? Paul Marshall, is that his name? Right, the guy who wrote the uh, Sol Solovia book? Yeah, and, and that's oh, the that's first Paul thing I ever Allen. read. Yeah. Paul, Al Paul Marshall Allen, is that his name? Yeah, that might be it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, which, you know, the, the pops are right, are funny when they write books about something. They, so they'll, they'll, they'll talk about Soloviev, and, but, and then it's, I'll interpret Soloviev through Rudolf Steiner. Right. Which is, and so I never really thought, I, I didn't really get a clear understanding. I didn't realize it at the time of who Soloviev was until I read Soloviev. And there's a pretty decent biography of Soloviev written by his nephew. Oh, really? Who was actually, was actually a Catholic priest, a Russian Catholic priest. Is that in um, English? It is in English. It was, oh. um, I don't know where it is. It's, it's, it, it's a pretty big book, but it's really interesting because you're getting kind of inside family information. And he, speaking of Dostoevsky, he's, you know, there's a lot of people have always suggested that, uh, that Soloviev was the model for Aloysia, in the, in the Brothers Karamazov. Mm -hmm. But his nephew says, yes, he was the model for Aloysia, but he was also the model for Ivan. Right, I've heard that. That's, that surprises me, actually. But I suppose that because uh, Soloviev was so grounded in European philosophy, that might have been why he said And he was so intellectually <laughs> penetrating, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he could pull out the ice cold logic when he wanted to. Right. You know? Yeah, his writing is so strangely uneven because of that. Uh -huh. It's like you're switching from person to person or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because my impression of Sophia in the anthroposophic world is much like yours. It's like it should be front and center and it's not. I almost feel like the Jungian world, even though they don't make reference to Sophia, that... Uh, Jung's treatment of Christianity really gets it in a much deeper way. Because, because he, you know, and I, th I think this is really important, you know, this idea of integration of the, of, of the masculine and the feminine. Right. And which is why Jung was also got really excited when the Catholic Church proclaimed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, or the, yeah, Immaculate Conception, right? Mm -hmm. or, or the Assumption, because yeah, he thought that was, uh, all right, we're, now we're coming to balance. Right. Which didn't happen, but whatever. But I think, you know, I think Robert Sardello is one of the only people who recognizes this. And I think 
Robert coming from a Catholic background mm -hmm. and being a psychoanalyst has, uh, uh, he has, uh, what do they, I would say he's, he had the perfect ground, background and ground to, to see that. Yeah. And that's when, when, I, when I interviewed uh, Margaret Barker for Jesus, the Imagination. One of the things she said, she said, you know, one of her biggest downfall as the scholar who was really, who's doing in biblical studies for sophiolo sophiology, which is astounding. But she said one of the things that's, that she feels hampers her progress is because she didn't grow up with Mary. She didn't grow up in a, in a church that had the Theotokos. So yeah. she, she doesn't have that kind of uh, intuition in the grain right mm -hmm. like like i might and robert might mm -hmm. right well the thing robert does which really you know hooked me was he, he has developed all those contemplative exercises where you're really working with silence and the physical organ of the heart and none of this chakra business mm -hmm. you know the idea that it's this is the organ that most participates in the material and the spiritual but he but he he creates an experience for you and only then you know do we start talking about it in terms of these beings and whatnot um the experience that really really got me with him was we were working with the after image so you know you're holding a stone and then you're closing your eyes and so on so he did that for a while and then he said go out and out in the property this was in north carolina and find find something to do it with so look at it close your eyes and then look at it again and so i found these weeds these flowering weeds and um, i looked at this yellow flower and i closed my eyes and i waited till the after image faded and then when i opened my eyes it was it, i swear to god the flower was like grinning at me like finally <laughs> And all the other flowers were moving around it, begging for my attention. Mm -hmm. I could, you know, it was, it was mind boggling. And so I ran back to the group all excited and uh, told them about it. And Robert said to me, he said, and from now on, you will never be able to be indifferent towards that flower. And I feel like that is, there's something about the relationship of the Sophianic and love mm -hmm. That, that's like that and it's almost like um it's almost like a remaking or th those kind of activities can re re not, not i don't want to use re-enchant but almost re-sacralize mm -hmm. something or or, re or i would I, it's a horrible word reset yeah for me because it's always like it was always it's, there it's, well it's a, it, that's why the chapter i have in the book on thomas Traherne. Mm -hmm. which i think you know he's what he a is, story that is he is the one who resets he's always takes and, and think about it all these you know profound philosophical insights are basically the things i thought as a little kid yeah about how the world worked mm -hmm. it's very simple it doesn't it's not complicated mm -hmm. that there you know like when he talks in his poetry you know how like an angel came I down, right? How all things, you know, we have, we, we lived in this relationship to things in, in nature in particular, but in with other kids as well, right? You see, you know, it, it's only later. And I think, you know, I talked about this a little bit. I think uh, Terrence Malick also examines this in his in his film uh, the tree of life right mm -hmm. where you come out of that innocence that participation in the world to a, to a distancing right mm -hmm. around you know puberty or probably a little younger than puberty where you start to see it other right? yeah yeah and 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 for Terhern, the secret is to recapture that mm -hmm. and once again the earth, nature is the great teacher in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not gonna be likely to happen in a suburban landscape. No, I, or the city, you know, <laughs> I hate for, a, for a kid from Detroit. Uh, the more and more I think about it, you know, 
Steiner said something along the lines of, you know, the problem with cities is people don't know how to breathe. If the people in cities knew, knew how to breathe, everything would be okay. Mm. Which was kind of an interesting notion. But what I noticed that is, uh, you know, I'm kind of blessed to live out in the middle of the woods where I live here on this farm. Um, because it, it's much easier for me to participate in nature than, you know, when I lived in the city. Yeah. You know, you, you have to kind of, you have to make an effort to do it when you live in the city. And it's, I don't have to make as much of an effort. I just love to, you have, just love to be mindful and be present, but it's, you don't have to drive anywhere, right? Well, and you have your source of inspiration for your research and writing right there outside your doorstep. You know, it, it probably is necessarily not very abstract. Um, it, there, that brings me to this other great quote that you uh, <laughs> that you put in the, towards the end of the book of Chesterton's. You, you write, <laughs> in considering the sterile benefits of modernity at the beginning of the 20th century, G.K. Chesterton saw the return to the land as a significant part of the return to sanity. Mm -hmm. If we ever get the English back onto English land, they will become again a religious people. If all goes well, a superstitious people. Yeah. The absence from life of both the higher and lower forms of faith is due largely to a divorce from nature and the trees and clouds. Yeah. So wonderful. That's a heck of a heck of a quote, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's such so, so classically Chesterton. Yeah. <laughs> He's a great copywriter. <laughs> yeah. So where where will you go now? What next? Uh I don't know where I'll go. I I started work on a book of poetry, been meaning to get back to poetry for a long time, but I keep getting sidetracked into these, these big other, these other big writing projects, but I've been writing poetry. So, which is, which is nice. It's, and, it, and writing poetry, it, it takes a while to get back into it. You can't just do it. No, I imagine. An essay or a blog, I can just do that. Um, but in poetry, it's, a, it's like, a, you have to get to a different way of making, different kind of presence to the, to the world. And it takes practice. And if you, and if you, and you have to do it, I, well, at least I do. And a couple of friends of mine, we've talked about this and they have the same experience. If you don't do it every day, it's hard to get back into it. Yeah. In fact, um, when my book Meditations and Times of Wonder was, was getting ready to be published, that's, that's how I met uh, Angelico Press through that book. And my publisher emails me and says, I don't think it's, an, it's long enough. Can you add something? Do you have anything to add? And I didn't really have much that I wanted to add. I said, well, give me two weeks. And I was actually in the middle of writing The Submerged Reality. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was, so I was writing that and I wrote about 20 or 30 poems to include them in that book. And you can probably tell which ones were <laughs> so few, the, the, the Submerged Reality poems. But it was kind of an interesting uh, activity. And, but I was able to do it because um, I just made myself do it. I remember we lived, it was our former house. I remember sitting down and saying, okay, what am I gonna write about? And I looked out the window and uh, it, was, it was actually this time of year. It was, uh, it was the solstice as, as a matter of fact. And it had just, uh, it had been it had snowed and, it, and our pond was frozen, and then it, but then it melted and it rained, and but the pond was still frozen, and uh, there was a heron walking on the surface, it looked like you know Jesus walking on the surface of of, of the, the sea, so I started with that image. Oh really? And, yeah, fantastic. And then and the poem's it's titled. Uh, um, reading Burma on the darkest day of the year, or something like that. Uh. And, and so, you, but the thing is, with with poetry, you get into this, you get into the rhythm, and you don't want to lose the rhythm because it's hard to get it back. 
it's interesting that we're talking about this because I would say that Sophia in Exile is a far more poetic book than Submerged Reality. Submerged Reality is a book that I'm going to be pulling off the shelf to make reference to, uh, you know, to, it's a reference text for me. It's a really, really good source material book. But this, this, this flows like a poem. And I, and then, I don't know if that was intentional, but that's why I, I toward the end, there's a, there's a lyric essay. Um, Fantastic. The, the Rosary of the Philosopher. Yeah, that's right. wonderful. That's wonderful. And, and this one also is more personal. I mean, there are a lot of stories about my family and mm -hmm. stuff in this one. And I think, and that's, I think I want that. I, I don't know if I wanted to make it more personal, but it just came out that way. You know, and what and what was interesting to me, and and when I wrote the the submerged reality, uh, I was still coming out of an academic context. Mm. It's much more an academic book. Yeah, so, no, and that, and that was not definitely not meant to be a criticism. But no, I know, but it just is. Yeah, it's like I real literally read both books with different parts of myself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wrote them with different parts of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is wonderful. Um, I highly recommend this to the audience. Um, if people want to uh, find out more about you or the Center for Sophia, uh, Sophiological Studies, they find you online? Just go to my website, so centerforsophiologicalstudies.com. And, do you, and uh, you can contact me through there. And do you have anything planned, any sort of event kind of things planned for 2022? Um, well, what I don't know if you probably saw this. I Over the summer, I built a yurt. Yes, I did. <laughs> and actually, I've been using it for a deer blind. <laughs> and it's really cool. But uh, our plan is to do some classes here on the farm, which I... I haven't had a chance to think of, think them through. I want to do one on sociology, and probably something on biodynamics mm -hmm. to start with. And actually, we might do. There's been some talk about us doing some things for uh, for for homeschool parents, especially homeschool parents interested in Waldorf methods. Since I used to be a Waldorf teacher, I have a gazillion Waldorf tricks, and actually tricks I just invented <laughs> as, a, as a teacher as a way to get the point across for for children right so we might do you know, there's a lot of things we could do yeah I mean uh, the audience doesn't know uh, Michael and I started a very brief <laughs> conversation that I hope goes somewhere but we're both of the mind that there has to be some new new forms of education that are not in any way dependent on things like uh, accreditation and oh yeah Poison. student loans and all that and i think the center for sociological studies is perfectly positioned for that yeah i want to eventually to turn it into a kind of a hedge school for growing up what do you mean by a hedge school well the hedge school uh the, the hedge schools were in, during uh, the British occupation of Ireland. The, 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 the British put their schools in place, right? And they wanted students to attend their schools, but the Irish don't play that way. <laughs> so the Irish, the Irish, you know, they would hire a, a hedge, hedge, they called them hedge schools, uh, row teacher. And they'd get this head, this schoolmaster who would come to town, you know, and all the people in the town would chip in to, to pay for his room and board or whatever. And he would teach the kids. He would teach, you know, like a one room schoolhouse kind of situation, but he would teach them everything from uh, navigation and three R's to uh, blacksmithing to all kinds of things, right? And, and, I, and I, so I've always, you know, it's kind of a subversive approach to education. And I think we need a head school for grownups. Yeah, which is uh, which and, and I, you know, who else did this was uh, Thoreau. Did he really? And the Transcendentalists, they they had they set up these schools that were alternative schools for adults, for adults for kids. You know, they, but they were they were they looked at what was available and they said no, no thanks, we'll do our own. 
Mm. And in fact, uh, Louisa May Alcott, I think she did as well. Mm. You know? And you know what, when we talked earlier about education and romanticism. Uh, I, when I was, I used to teach a course for people who were, it was a master's degree co course for teaching writing and speaking for, you know, classroom. people worked on a master's degree in education. And one of the thing I made them read was Anne of Green Gables because Lucy Maud Montgomery was steeped in the romantics and she saw how the romantic uh, poetry really hit a nerve with those kids. Wow. Around their age, especially seventh and eighth grade, right? Ninth grade. And there's a beautiful scene in, in the book where uh, Anne and her friends are down by the river and they want to perform uh, the Lady of Shalott from Tennyson. And she gets into a boat, and of course, the boat gets unmoored and goes down the river, right? But this is the, you know, and Lucy Maud Montgomery knew this is what speaks to kids, right? The entering into the imagination and the idealism, you know, and, and when I taught, um, I was teaching seventh grade at a Waldorf school and the story, one of the stories that most captivated them was when I told them the story of the death of Percy Shelley. And I, find, I don't know if you know this, but what happened, Shelley was a great sailor, but a lousy swimmer. And he lived in Italy near Florence and he was, he took his, his craft out and there was a big storm that whipped up and the, the ship was capsized and he drowned. Um, a few days later, his body washed up on the shore and they would not let his body be transported, I think to Rome where his son was buried because they were afraid of spreading cholera. Mm. Sound familiar? <laughs> and uh, so his friend Trelawney, I think his name was, was, was a physician, got permission to burn the body on the shore of the sea. So here they are burning Shelley's body on the shore of the sea. And, and it takes a long time to burn a body. Yeah. So they're at the end, especially when it's been in salt water for a while. And when it finally started to collapse from being incinerated, the rib cage opened up and revealed his heart. And Trelawney reached in and grabbed it and wrapped it in a handkerchief to give to Mary Shelley. And I believe uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think that heart is at the Metropolitan Museum or the Metropolitan Library in New York. What a story. And you tell that story to seventh graders, they're like, I am totally into this story. <laughs> right? Yeah. But I'd say it's a good way, it's a good place for us to, to wrap it up because, I mean, that is the image of, in a way, what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to preserve. Mm -hmm the heart of, ro of right. romanticism, right? That's right. The heart of the world, the heart of poetry. Right. Well, sir, that was fantastic. Um, hey, we, we, I love doing this with you. <laughs> I love doing it too. And for those of you who are listening, we will be doing a book club in a few months, but we won't tell you what the book is. <laughs> we don't have a book yet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Have a great day. And you too. Time. Thank you.